Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Middle East Outlook session at the World Policy Conference in Abu Dhabi. I'm Terry Martin. I'm a Berlin-based broadcast journalist, and some of you may remember me from yesterday when I chaired the Ukraine session. Um, today, I'm jumping in for Stephen Erlanger. Stephen Erlanger, I understand, is a regular at this conference. Uh, he was originally scheduled to chair this session, but was called back to work. So my apologies to any of you who were expecting to see Stephen Erlanger up here. There's no way I can fill Steve's big shoes, but I, I assure you I will do my very best to make this panel worth your while. I'll introduce our distinguished guests in just a moment, but first I want to say, if this conference had been held one month ago, uh, we would be having a very different conversation than the one we're about to have right now. The attack by Hamas on Israel on October 7th and Israel's response have shattered the status quo and put a big question mark over the immediate future of this region. The repercussions, of course, have been global. It's being felt around the world. Over the next hour and a half, we'll explore uh, what has changed since October 7th so far and what hasn't changed, uh, what's at stake in the coming months, and how the conflict might shape the region moving forward. Now, we're not going to talk exclusively about the conflict, but there's a good chance that 98% of it will, uh, will be related to it. Now, understandably, public attention right now is focused very much on the suffer, on the profound suffering and risks inherent in this war, but uh, I will encourage our panel to explore, uh, to also reflect on the possibility for exploring a viable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, because obviously such a solution uh, can be regarded as essential to the future of peace and stability uh, in the region. Now, we do have a great panel on this topic. I'm going to just quickly introduce them now, uh, starting from my left. Uh, Mohammed Baharun, I hope I got that right, is director and co-founder of the Dubai Policy uh, Public Policy Research Center. Before that, he was editor of the Gulf Defense magazine and worked for multiple media outlets, so a colleague in that sense. He played a key role in the United Arab Emirates National Identity Initiative, I understand, and he's a founding board member of the of Busola, the Busola Institute, uh, which is a Brussels-based think tank focusing on the ties between the EU and the Gulf Cooperation Council states. So, yeah. Nabil Fahmi, next to him, uh, and I'm sure that uh, I understand that you've been here also a time or two yourself, uh, is Dean Emeritus at the American University in Cairo, where he founded the School of Global Affairs. Uh, he's also a career diplomat. He was Egypt's Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, also Ambassador to the United States and, and Japan before that. He also worked extensively with the United Nations on disarmament and international security. Renaud Gérard is senior reporter and international columnist at the French daily Le Figaro. He covered global political crises and armed conflicts for 40 years. Uh, he's a journalist, uh, also a colleague in that sense, but uh, you know, very accomplished, much more accomplished than I am. He's written several books on the Middle East and uh, diplomatic issues, so he's well versed in these topics. Volker Pertes, someone I've known for quite a while in Germany uh, when he was head of Stiftung Wissenschaft and Politik, that's uh, international, the Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP, some of you may know. Uh, he is currently Under Secretary General and head of the strategic review team of the United Nations Assistance Mission in Iraq. He formerly served as Special Representative of the Secretary General uh, for Sudan and head of the UN's transition assistance mission in Sudan. He was also UN Assistant Secretary General and Senior Advisor to the UN Special Envoy for Syria and was previously director, of, the, as I mentioned, of SWP. So we've got someone very uh, with intimate knowledge of a couple of the signatories of the Abraham Accords as well. Itamar Rabinovich uh, was supposed to be, be joining us. He couldn't 
travel here. He's going to still try, they we're trying to reach him right now. He was planning to visit us remotely. Uh, we're hoping that he'll be here. Uh, he's Professor Emeritus of Middle Eastern History at Tel Aviv University uh, and President Emeritus and Counselor of the Israel Institute with offices in Washington and Tel Aviv, uh, Distinguished Fellow of the Brookings Institution, and so on. He served as Ambassador of, of Israel to the United States and Chief Negotiator with Syria in the mid-1990s. That, that experience would be very valuable to have with us today. I'm hoping that we will still be able to contact him remotely. I'll, I'll keep you up to date on that. And at the other end of our, our large stage here, we have Dorothee Schmidt. She is head of the Turkey Middle East program at the French Institute of International uh, Relations, IFRI, which is behind this. Uh, her work is focused on European policies in the Mediterranean and the Middle East, on the dynamics in these regions, and on the Arab policy of France. She's done extensive work tracking the emergence of Turkey as a global power. So, thank you to all of our panelists for being with us today. It's an amazing group of speakers that I think are going to be able to pro, uh, give us some real insights on, on where we are and where things might be headed. We'll start with each of our speakers delivering some opening remarks. Uh, remarks will be delivered partly uh, in, in English, mainly in English, partly in French. Uh, so if you need some headphones, please, please get them now. Uh, I will then get the discussion going along the way. I plan to integrate some input from, from the floor, from all of you. So during the last third of the, of the session, we're going to try to, I'll be calling on you for questions or if you just raise your hand when we get there. So let's, uh, let's see who wanted to be first. I think uh, Nabil Fami wanted to be first. There you go. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not sure I wanted to be first. You offered but I agreed. Yes, he offered. <laughs> Nobody wanted to be first. But that was the point. Okay. <laughs> Kindly offered. Let me first thank Terry for the kind invitation to be back here. It's always been a very informative event for me, and I've learned a lot from many of the panels. I want to also start by repeating what you just said. A month ago, or a little bit more, when I first got the invitation to come, I looked at the topic, and I frankly would have given you a completely different presentation. Because as an Egyptian, looking westwards, I see a failed state on my right in Libya. I see a failed state in Sudan southwards. There was no peace process. There was no, there was no violence, but there's no peace process. Looking eastwards between the Palestinians and the Israelis, Syria is still coming out of a nightmare. And then all the way down, to uh, uh, Yemen and the tensions with Iran. There were a lot of problems. Uh, I won't focus on any of them, but let me simply say that I actually expect what happened in Gaza to have negative effects on all of these. Because on the one hand, there is clearly a regionalization of conflicts in the region with the major powers trying to figure out what role they want to play. And there's going to be an opportunity for players in all of these conflicts to try to get as much more leverage out of their positions than in the past when uh, we weren't focused uh, on the Gaza issue. The second point I'd make is, uh, and I've gone hoarse trying to make this over the years, is never assume that the Arab-Israeli conflict is over only because there's no active bloodshed occurring. Uh, and it's something that we kept hearing over and over again. The Palestine issue is not important. It's not a pressure point. It's not a priority. Uh, it always breaks out unless we solve the problem between Arabs and Israelis. The question will never be whether or not there will be violence. It will be when is the next cycle of violence. Uh, whether it's on the previous conflicts I mentioned or on the most recent conflict, countries in the region have to have better governance. And when I mean that, I mean not only domestically and regionally, but also in terms of respect for international law in their international relations. Unless that becomes the focus of how we operate and how we move. The idea of 
a balance of power, that's always a variant. And the problem here is that it's not always a balance of power between nation states. It's a balance of power between who's ready to, to cause more damage and more pain on the other side. Uh, when one looks at what happened recently, clearly there is a higher profile for non-state parties. And clearly there is an, an argument being presented, I don't agree with it, that irrespective of the issue, revenge and collateral damage, inhumane collateral damage, is acceptable in order to respond to what is considered to be the initial uh, source of conflict. My, re my point really here is we need to have an Arab-Israeli uh, process that leads to Arabs and Israelis living peacefully in the Middle East. And at the core of that is the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, that will require an ending of occupation and it will require to be able to have the national identity for Israelis and for the Palestinians in viable sovereign states. Uh, I've heard very frequently that two-state solution is dead or difficult. I argue it's difficult much more now than in the past. I don't think it's dead and I so I hope it's not dead because I don't see a one-state solution as a viable alternative to solve the problem. One-state solution means that the Israelis and the Palestinians forego their desire for a singular national identity and decide on a common identity between them, and I don't see that happening peacefully. It may become a one-state reality, but then you will have continuous conflict between these two peoples because it can't be a reality that ends up giving priority to one state versus the others. Now let me just for a very few minutes, my country started the peace process with Israel uh, after embarking on a war which was intentionally started with the explained objective of starting negotiations. That's, I'm talking about the 73 war. Uh, and we were the first to sign a peace agreement. That being said, even back then in the 70s, part of our agreement with the Israelis had a framework agreement for, to create a threshold for an agreement between Palestinians and Israelis. What happened in the last five we four weeks is really going to the core of Arab-Israeli hatred and anger. And if we start to light that fire again, we will all pay a very severe price for it. Nation states, as angry as they may be, have to respect international law, have to respect international humanitarian law, and including uh, uh, the laws that govern war. And we need to go back to trying to establish a two-state solution. Now, is that possible now? I'll sum it up in very few words. We need to deal on an emergency basis with a crisis management situation. The continuous deaths of civilians every day, destruction of Gaza, about 25, if not 30 percent, completely destroyed, cannot be the basis for a relationship between Arabs and Israelis. For every combatant that is killed, you are planting the seeds for 10 more who have lost family and will want revenge and retribution in the future. So uh, the, we need to get a ceasefire, not for the ceasefire's sake, but just to control the, 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 the viciousness of the combat with the objective of ultimately then moving on to a conflict resolution phase, which has to be 
essentially a two-state solution. I would argue that this requires an Arab initiative. We need to take the issue in our own hands. And it also requires responsibility of the major states uh, globally, be they the Americans, I just came from China, the Chinese, uh, or anybody else, to go back to how do we bring the parties, the Israelis and the Palestinians in particular, back to a negotiating table. If they don't believe in the end result, this will be my closing comment, having done these negotiations for most of my career, this is not the best time to start this project by any standard, whether, and whether it's with respect to the leadership paradigm on the Palestinian side or the Israeli side. But we can't afford not to. And I therefore suggest that dealing with the crisis situation is imperative, but then what we need to put to the Israeli and Palestinian center, to the public, is not an interim solution. We need to actually offer them what are the elements in as much detail as we can of closure. Where will the two-state solution actually be? How do we deal with the different components of that? And that will ultimately achieve for Palestinians what they want in terms of a national state, and it will achieve for the Israelis what they are even calling for in the midst of combat, which is security for Israelis in the future. So let me just throw out those two points. This is not the time for continued violence. We're, we're planting the seeds of non-state party violence for the future. And it's not the time for incremental proposals uh, because they aren't enough to bridge the pain and get over what's happened over the last few weeks. Thank you very much. Now, Bia Fahmi, thank, thank you very much. Uh, you've touched on a number of points which I'm sure we're going to be picking up on over the next uh, hour or so. Uh, what's, what came through for me, most importantly, it's not just an Israeli-Palestinian issue. There's the Arab-Israeli issue that needs to be addressed as well. And there may be room within this in seeking solutions and in, in these processes that you've uh, s suggested need to be pushed forward. There may be a role for other actors outside the region uh, from around the world uh, to play a diplomatic role. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move to Dorothy now. Dorothy Schmidt, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Terry. Um, so I think it's not an easy moment for us all because we lately we were mainly commenting on the deconfliction in the region. Um, uh, speaking about the Saudi-Iran normalization, about the Abrahamic Accords, of course, um, prospects of normalization with Syria that had been uh, ushered back into the Arab League. And now we've just been drawn back again, backwards in history to this uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict that we all wanted to forget or we, it, it seems that we missed something, something very big because now we see the consequences are sort of spreading within all of these conflicts that we were trying to solve, just like uh, Nabil Fahmi said. I must say, speaking as an, as an EU citizen who's been an observer, a, a rather fascinated observer of the efforts that the EU's done to establish and stabilize the Palestinian Authority, all of these efforts that fell totally into a, the Hamas trap in 2006 after the elections, when the EU decided to turn its back on, on Gaza, and we are now against, as I said, drawn forcibly into this trap. Um, so the three points I want to make is first that I think we, we're going through a moment of flu that has been described more or less by Nabil Fahmi in the beginning of his speech, um, saying that uh, m most regional actors are still struggling with where they should stand and what, how they're going to coalesce or not to find a solution. But my concern is that this moment of flu could freeze into a sort of again, the West against the rest. And Gaza will be the sort of symbolic point that would catalyze this divide of the West, um, explicitly said the US, the EU, and Israel, against a very heterotic sort of uh, group of countries that have stood against 
what they feel as blatant injustice against the massacre in, in Gaza that have been, are being perpetrated by, by Sahel currently as a sort of revenge operation for this horrendous attack that they've, they've gone through in early October. So my problem is how do we avoid uh, falling into, again, this uh, narrative that I see emerging against this flu. And the flu is because we work on the backdrop of a collapse of state structures in most of the countries in the region. We've seen that in CIA. Arguably, Lebanon has become a sort of face state as well. Uh, war is spreading, non or unresolved conflicts. And we have also this flu between what is a conflict, what's a war, that was alluded to by uh, Thierry this morning. And um, I see, um, I heard uh, Hassan Salami saying, now you don't declare war these days, we slide into war. So this is, this is the concern we have, is that we're being drawn into war. Everybody's wondering about potential escalation with Lebanon. The Hezbollah says they don't want to go to war. The Leb Lebanon is exhausted, but they might be sort of sliding into war without even realizing it. So uh, this, this emerging uh, rationale of the, the West against the rest on Gaza specifically um, goes with this idea that the, the area of conflict is enlarging in the mines. There has been a historical effort to sort of uh, constrain the conflict to Palestine against Israel after the Arab-Israeli conflict. But I think this is totally failing now. Uh, on the contrary, lots of countries now feel uh, concern for the situation there. But the other side, which is also a lot worrying for our own societies, Western societies, is that through migrations and diasporas, we see the divide operating in our own societies now and threatening uh, order and peace in our own societies. And in France, this is particularly uh, clear. So. Um, who is the rest if we have the West on one side? The rest is you have two very big opportunistic actors, Russia and China, clearly. Russia now turning its back on Israel, but also Israel turning its back on Russia. So this is sort of mutual soft divorce currently. China, who is now expressing interest for the, they have, they have always said that they were in favor, they were in favor of the two-state solution. I mean, if you, if you go to the sort of very uh, classical consolidated rhetoric of the Chinese, they may have been the last defenders of the two-state solutions in the world, maybe. But I see Africa and Asia a lot, as I said, um, now standing against the humanitarian massacre, but also what they feel as a political injustice in, uh, in Gaza. The second point is, uh, in that context, I think, I think three countries are especially interesting to look at. The three countries, to me, I know, of course, Israel, Iran, are, you know, some protagonists that we will have to dwell on to speak about more later. But for me, what's more interesting nowadays, Egypt. Why? Because it was the first Arab countries to make peace with Israel. And now, as Jordan, actually, there's a question mark as about how to proceed to enlarge the zone of peace. The second interesting actor, protagonist, is Saudi Arabia because there is a lot of pressure on them to revive the peace plan. And the idea is that maybe there could be a sort of coming of age of the Saudi diplomacy now. And as Nabil Fahmi said, we need an Arab solution for this. We need an Arab plan anyway. So they may have the symbolic material resource, but do they have the political maturity to do it? And the third country, which I know and I'm following on a daily basis, is Turkey, which actually moved from the status of outsider to a primary actor in this conflict also with uh, Tayyip Erdogan having, uh, pursuing a very consistent pro-Palestinian, you know, uh, uh, stance uh, and being extremely vocal against Israel for the last 15 years uh, and proposing to mediate in the beginning and now again escalating rhetorically against Israel. Uh, but my, my concern is that if you think in terms of military escalation, I mean, Erdogan has also said many times that he thought uh, Tsahal was uh, uh, behaving in a very unmoral way and that uh, they should not go too far, etc. And we know Turkey is the one uh, military power that is extremely active in the region currently, and they already had an, a skirmish with Israeli forces in 20. 
2010 that led to the breakup of relations with Israel. So to conclude, how do we avoid this scenario? And uh, sorry, uh, I'm insisting on these three countries also because they're on both sides. I won't say that they're private countries, but they're friends of the West, but they talk to the rest. They're part of the rest, if you want. Uh, so how do we avoid this scenario of um, an isolated West against an angry global South, as the Americans would frame it? I think it is very clear that we have to take political responsibility for the Palestinians and not economic responsibility. The, the matter has become political again. Uh, and there, of course, Americans are the ones who everybody will turn to to make peace. And I think, again, they are the number one. And, and we see Blinken has a very hard time now traveling to the, to the region and rebalancing from week to week how to operate with every protagonist of the crisis. Uh, the EU that has been rather silent uh, has stood with Israel, but clearly there is this uh, deep historic regret of having failed on the Palestinian uh, solution. But I think the, the country that we have to speak about also is clearly there in terms of responsibility, Israel. Um, because first thing is that I think you have to make peace with the countries you are, or you are at war with. I mean, the Abrahamic Accord are a very interesting device, a diplomatic device, but uh, the countries that are involved are not the ones that have to make real peace with Israel, in fact. They're not primarily concerned with the conflict. And then I think, of course, we have to find a way to make the Israelis look at, 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 the, at the Palestinians as political partners again and not only as a um, sort of a leftover of, a, of the, the grand quest for the consolidation of the uh, Israeli nation state. Uh, so is it wishful thinking? Of course, we will be struggling. We now, we now, now it's time for war, clearly, uh, but it's also time for the humanitarian operations, as had been said all for these three days also. Uh, but working towards the sustainable solution, I totally agree with Nabil Fahimi that it, now it's time to close this file, otherwise it can escalate. Um, so we have to close it. It means we also have a historical opportunity to take care of this. This requires political patronage, clearly from the US, according to me, and this will not be easy with maybe the next administration. We don't know what the future brings. It needs political will. But it also needs economic resources, of course, and this is where the Abraham Accords rationale has, has its place, clearly. Thank you very much, uh, Dorothee. Um, I, you know, you've covered, again, a lot of ground. The, all of the points that are being made here are hugely germane to our, our discussion. Uh, you mentioned Turkey. It's my understanding that President Biden is planning to meet with uh, Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan tomorrow. I believe he's traveling to, to the region. Uh, that, that should be an interesting meeting to keep our eyes on. Uh, the points you were making about the potential, the risks inherent in this conflict, that it has the potential to freeze over into a conflict between, uh, again, this term that's been popping up here, uh, the West against the rest, uh, and you, were, you kindly helped to define what the rest might be, in, in, uh, where, where we had a bit of an issue on that yesterday. But you also pointed out uh, the risk of this, uh, you know, of countries in the region sliding into war, uh, thinking particularly about uh, about Hezbollah in, in Lebanon on this, the risk of that. Uh, but you then emphasize the, the importance of, uh, of trying to expand the uh, zone of peace, as you put it, which I think is a nice phrase to describe the, the, some of the surrounding Arab countries that have made peace with Israel and, and potential for doing that forward. So your question about how to get the Israelis and the Palestinians back working on a, on a common political project for their own mutual benefit uh, would indeed be the, the challenge. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, I'm, I can see now on my screen that we might be able to bring in uh, our, our, our participant from Israel. Oh, yeah, look at that. I do see something great. Excellent. I'm really happy about that. Uh, just just to tell, tell you guys, I'm wearing my, my headphones. Maybe this is for the technical crew because the monitors, it makes it very difficult for me to understand what people at the other end, even right, you know, next to me are saying, so I'm just wearing this for my own benefit. Thank you very much. Um, now, Itamar... Rabinovich, can you hear me? Yes, I can. 
Excellent. Oh, can you hear me? We can, and we're so glad that you're with us because your voice in this conversation is essential. Uh, can you tell us where you're joining us from? We can see you're in a in a vehicle. Uh, I am in a vehicle. We had uh, some understanding about the panel, so I'm not at my home as I plan to be. I'm in my car, but speaking on my phone. But here I am, anyway, and uh, delighted to be with you. Excellent. We can see and hear you very well, and it's just fine that you're in that car. We're, we're very glad that you can join us today. Um, would, would you like to offer a few comments? We've just been getting underway. I did an introduction uh, of our guests, including yourself, on, uh, with the hope that you would be joining us. And um, we've heard from a couple of speakers so far. We've touched on some of the themes. Uh, you know, we've been in email contact with one another, so uh, we're staying pretty much on track with what we discussed. Uh, would you like to uh, offer some comments to the plenary at this point over the next couple of minutes and then before we move on to the next speaker? Yes, yes. I think that we need to look at uh, so-called the day, the day after. The day after, we must have a vision of where where we want to take the region and the Arab-Israeli relationship to, um, which means dealing with the, the uh, larger Palestinian question in the Israeli relationship with the Palestinian Authority and the organization. I I heard the the reference. Uh, before to the West against the rest. It doesn't have to be that. Um, I think there are several countries in the Middle East that do not see the problem with the West, but see the problem with Iran. Uh, our host itself, Saudi Arabia and others have been the targets of violence by proxies of Iran. I see that the current war is not just a war between Israel and Hamas, but between Israel and Israel is targeted or threatened by five Iranian proxies. And in order to organize the region to deal with these issues, there will have to be a plan for dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian relationship. It's difficult to envisage it where in the middle of a war, we have the wrong government, the wrong Israeli government for for doing that, but the need is there. Uh, the debate inside Israel today is do you deal with the uh, political issues domestically in the middle of a war, or do you wait for the end of the war, whatever that end may be. But I hope that at the end of it, there'll be a government in Israel that would be willing to look at the larger picture and to fit into a scheme that would help organize the region including dealing with the larger Palestinian question. Thank you very much. Uh, do, if you don't have anything to add, we'll move along. Um, that sounds, um, it didn't take you very long to get to Iran and Iran's proxies, uh, the role that they're playing in this, in this war. I think that's an, an, a hugely important part of this, of course. We need to discuss that. It's also important what you mentioned about the political uh, context within Israel itself and the uh, ability of the Israeli government or willingness of it to uh, to address this problem in a constructive way. These are question marks uh, that you've raised. Thank you. Thank you for now. Did you, if you don't have anything else to add, I don't want to interrupt you. You're very well. Okay. Um, our, our, our connection seems to be stable. I hope it will stay that way. Uh, so we'll continue then here on, on the panel bringing in voices. Uh, let's go now to Folke Pertes. You're next. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, let me first say, I have to say that I'm speaking here in a, in a purely private capacity. Uh, I have colleagues in the UN system who are working day and night on the conflict, and they are the ones who should speak officially for the, for the United Nations. But of course, I'm a colleague of them, and I, I support the great work they are doing both on the humanitarian and on the political front. W when I thought about this panel, I thought that I, I hoped that this great group of people would probably come up with two things. A, with, with lessons, which we always need, lessons 
from where we go from here, what we have learned from, from the current crisis and what went wrong before, and then, of course, avenues for diplomacy, avenues for diplomatic actions, both, both to protect civilians and to reach an end to the conflict and to open a new path to peace and security in the Middle East, which would include, of course, that Israel can live in recognized and secure borders and that the Palestinians can live in dignity in their own state and in peace with, in peace with their neighbors. Maybe I should start with a comment what actually happened or how it looks to me. On 7th October, we had an unprecedented, horrific terrorist attack targeting mainly civilians, more than a thousand killed, more than 200 abducted, taken hostage. And I think that not only in Jewish eyes, this does not look like an act of resistance against occupation, but it looks like a pogrom, it looks like mass murder, and nothing else. And it was followed by a horrific counterattack on the Gaza Strip, which has been creating a humanitarian disaster, unprecedented for the Gaza Strip at least. The victims again being mainly civilians, and the order or the advice to one million Palestinians from the northern part of the Gaza Strip to evacuate to the south brings up for many Palestinians the trauma or the memory of forced displacement placement <coughs> and exile. Now I can only underline here what my Secretary General, Secretary General of the United Nations has said, that nothing not even the grievances of Palestinians over decades can justify the appalling attack by Hamas. But also that this appalling attack by Hamas cannot justify any collective punishment of the people in Gaza. Even wars have laws, we call them international humanitarian laws, Today, an international humanitarian law has to be upheld any time. We need an immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. We need immediate, sustained humanitarian aid. And we need at least a humanitarian ceasefire to make that possible. Let me add that the Secretary General of the United Nations also, and he was heavily criticized for that by some actors, he also spoke of context, or he said that these horrific acts haven't happened in a vacuum. And yes, he was criticized for that. But let me make clear that if you speak of context, and context as such does not justify anything, certainly not actions against our deepest human norms. But we do need to know the context in order to understand the chain of events. And even more importantly, we need to be aware of historical contexts in order to lay out a strategy and a path for the future. If we try to strategize without context, we will not get very far. So let me come to the lessons. I think the main lesson, and Nabil has, has basically said it in different words, and Anwar Gargash spoke about it yesterday, is that it is not possible to achieve peace and stability in the wider Middle East without an acceptable solution to the Palestinian issue. Or put it differently, we cannot substitute regional peace for peace between Palestinians and Israelis. I think the government of the United Arab Emirates was aware of that when it signed the Abraham Accords because it linked its signature at that time to Israel abstaining from annexing parts 
of the West Bank. So the link was, was very, very clear. I think the second lesson, again and again, and it's not a new lesson, is that you cannot separate humanitarian, political, and security issues, or put it differently again, if people are left in utter humanitarian distress, also after this crisis, then this will only breed more desperation, more hate, and probably also new terror. So where to go? Are there avenues for diplomacy? I think we have to distinguish between the immediate and the midterm. In the immediate future, in the next days, and the next weeks, of course, I repeat, we need a humanitarian ceasefire or humanitarian ceasefires, and we need to prevent a wider war or sliding, as Dorota said, into a wider war, which means a lot of responsibility for regional actors, not only for the United States or United Nations or other international players, but particularly for actors in the region, now speaking of Arab states here, who have made peace with Israel at the same time, I'm looking to this country here, who have also normalized relationships with Iran, which actually gives a chance to work for de-escalation region. For the midterm, I guess we should not ignore the date of the Hamas attack, which was exactly 50 years after the October War or Yom Kippur War of 1973, and that, I think, raises a challenge to international diplomacy to, in a way, try to make this another 1973 moment. Now, I know historical analogies only go so far, and uh, they are always limited in value, but the 1973 war, with the effort of strong American diplomacy at that time, led to peace between Egypt and Israel. And it led to a stabilization between Syria and Israel, which held for decades. And it led the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, to embracing political engagement and focus on statehood and statehood at the side of Israel in the West Bank of Gaza. Now, of course, I know that the history of Middle East peace efforts in the 50 years that passed was full of failures and setbacks and people who wanted to undermine it. I don't want to go through this history. It would also take us much beyond our panel time here. However, I would, in this context, say that diplomacy after this war needs to restart serious, comprehensive peace efforts, and I totally concur with my friend Nabil that if it doesn't look as very realistic or probable to achieve in the next couple of weeks or months or years, we still have to make an effort. There is no alternative to that. And what does it mean? I think it means, in the first place, that diplomatic efforts to find a solution or find a series of interconnected solutions cannot be about recreating the status quo ante in Gaza, which is about, or has been about, in the last couple of years, managing, or as Anwar Gargash said yesterday, containing the conflict. That has not worked. I think that the UN Security Council has to decide on security arrangements for Gaza rather soon. And if I take up what Nabil said about an Arab initiative or an Arab plan, I think security arrangements could or probably should include a UN-mandated temporary Arab military presence in Gaza in order to maintain security and keep the peace after this Israeli operation or war. And then we need a well-prepared 
new peace conference, comprehensive peace conference that will certainly not be for 2024 because it needs time for, for preparation. It may arguably be co-sponsored by the United States and China under UN auspices, I hope. And it should clearly define the two-state solution as an outcome, not sort of be too open on outcomes. As some of the other speakers said, the two-state solution is back because the alternatives to the two-state solution have not worked. And it needs to include the socio-economic dimension, uh, which also builds on the Abraham Accords, as well as the normalization between Gulf Arab states and Iran. So looking at the conditions here, we are actually in a slightly better place than we were in 1991. There are other dimensions where we are not in a better place, but let us look to those conditions which we can use or exploit productively to actually go forward on a path out of this catastrophe and into a peaceful or more peaceful future of the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you very much, Volker Pett has uh, some excellent points there, uh, both reviewing the where things are now and how it relates to what has happened in the past, uh, looking at, conf at wars in the past that have indeed led to uh, to opportunities, uh, windows for, for pursuing peace with at least some of, of Israel's neighbors. Um, what I found particularly interesting, the, the point you made about the, uh, the need for a UN mandated temporary Arab military presence uh, in Gaza at some point to, to as a stabilizing temporary transitional period also is something I'm hearing more and more about uh, also at this at this conference so uh, anyway thank you also for the for the UN reviewing the UN perspective and also the the importance of context that this is a this is the context here is hugely complex and important very good um, sitting right next to me Mohammed Baharun, I haven't forgotten you, and I'm, I remember you being a very polite host, saying that you uh, you don't want to be first, and so um, you, we're going to get to you. You're going to be last. So you, uh, we'll, meanwhile, though, we're going to give the floor to Renaud Girard. The floor is yours. Merci. Comme il y a une traduction, je vais parler dans ma langue, le français, parce que. Ça m'a pris beaucoup de peine, une langue à apprendre dans ma jeunesse, et donc je vais essayer de l'utiliser. Euh, oui, le 7 octobre est évidemment un événement à impact majeur. Euh, les causes et les conséquences sont évidemment tout à fait différentes euh, de l'attentat terroriste du 11 septembre, mais les attaques terroristes du 7 octobre vont avoir, je crois, un impact considérable euh, sur, pas seulement sur la région, mais je pense même sur euh, le monde entier. Donc, en fait, si je devais donner un résumé à ma conférence, ce serait un conflit local, un prix mondial. Et ce n'est pas le cas de tous les conflits. Récemment, nous avons euh, eu un conflit euh, dans un territoire à peu près grand comme euh, la Cisjordanie. Euh, la Cisjordanie, c'est un département français comme, euh, comme euh, superficie, c'est à peu près 6 000 km, ce qui s'appelle euh, le Haut-Karabakh. Et, euh, et d'ailleurs, toute la population du Haut-Karabakh a fini euh, par être euh, chassée ethnique, dans un conflit, si on prend le conflit de septembre 2020 et le dernier jour de conflit, qui, euh, en nombre de morts, c'est à peu près ce que ce conflit euh, du 7 octobre euh, a fait. C'est passé complètement comme une lettre à la poste, personne n'en a parlé. Alors, il y a des conflits qui sont encore beaucoup plus sanglants dans le monde, qui se déroulent en ce moment, comme le conflit entre les Tigréens, les Érythréens, les Amaras, les Oromo en Éthiopie, dont personne ne parle, et euh, ils continuent avec un nombre de morts euh, bien et de réfugiés bien supérieurs. 
Pourquoi est-ce qu'on parle tant euh, du euh, conflit israélo-palestinien D'abord parce que, en fait, dans les relations internationales, le ressenti est beaucoup plus important que la réalité. C'est le ressenti de la réalité qui est important. Et le ressenti, c'est qu'il euh, y a eu un crime abominable en Europe euh, et les Occidentaux, notamment euh, euh, les Américains, qui n'avaient pas fait grand-chose pour sauver les Juifs. On se souvient de la conférence... Euh, euh, de l'hôtel royal à Evian, où ils avaient refusé de prendre les réfugiés euh, euh, juifs d'Allemagne. Euh, euh, les grandes puissances de l'époque, et l'Union euh, soviétique pour d'autres raisons, ont euh, voulu réparer une, un crime, le crime de la Shoah, par une injustice, ou ce qui a été ressenti par une injustice. Vous me direz que le problème est beaucoup plus complexe que ça, parce qu'en fait, euh, en Palestine, vous avez deux légitimités qui s'opposent. La légitimité arabe, puisque en 1880, il y avait 500 000 arabes pour 30 000 juifs en Palestine, qui était une région ottomane, et la légitimité sioniste, parce que les sionistes, les juifs venus d'Europe, ils ont construit un État. Avant qu'il arrive, Tel Aviv, c'était des, euh, des marais, c'était plein de moustiques, ils ont construit cet État. Donc vous avez deux légitimités euh, qui s'opposent, mais euh, le sentiment euh, du, non, seulement, non seulement des nations arabes, des peuples arabes, je ne parle pas des gouvernants, je parle des, des, des populations, et qu'on a réparé un crime par une injustice, mais ça s'étend même euh, au population euh, non musulmane euh, d'autres euh, continents. On a vu des réactions extrêmement fortes, par exemple, en Amérique latine, euh, à ces images, donc un ressenti en Amérique latine, qui a, euh, alors que l'Amérique latine n'a strictement rien à voir avec le problème euh, israélo-palestinien. Alors, ce 7 octobre aura des conséquences, d'abord locales, comme tout conflit local, et des conséquences euh, mondiales. Les conséquences locales, ben c'est très simple. En Israël, on a désormais la preuve que la droite sécuritaire est moins bonne que la gauche progressiste pour protéger les citoyens israéliens. Euh, aucun gouvernement de gauche a eu 1400 euh, citoyens massacrés. Euh, et euh, l'erreur, elle est idéologique, c'est qu'on a euh, dégarni le front sud, la division du front sud, pour l'envoyer, euh, au lieu de protéger les frontières internationalement reconnues d'Israël. Tous ces kibbutz étaient dans des frontières internationalement reconnues d'Israël on a été envoyé ces soldats israéliens protéger des colonies illégales et des colons qui s'étaient comportés extrêmement mal depuis le début de l'année, tuant plus de 200 euh, Palestiniens avec une sorte de « license to kill » donné par le gouvernement de droite et d'extrême droite euh, israélien. Donc ça, c'est la, la preuve. Et euh, évidemment que le gouvernement Netanyahou va devoir payer Netanyahou lui-même pour ne pas avoir protégé ces kibbutz, qui étaient d'ailleurs peuplés plutôt de gens pacifistes et euh, qui voulaient euh, faire la paix avec les euh, Palestiniens. Du côté euh, du Hamas, il y aura aussi un problème qu'on n'a pas tout à fait souligné, c'est que le ressenti dans les populations arabes, autant, euh, c'est vrai que dans les réseaux sociaux, on a salué l'audace militaire du Hamas d'avoir utilisé ces ces petits hélicoptères, etc. Mais euh, il y a quand même eu un très grand problème d'indiscipline euh, et euh, de crimes euh, contre des bébés, contre des, des, euh, des, euh, des vieillards, etc. Et euh, tous les mouvements euh, qui se prétendent être des mouvements de résistance ne se sont pas, dans l'histoire du Moyen-Orient, comportés de la sorte. J'ai assisté personnellement euh, après le euh, retrait israélien 
de 2000, qui n'avait pas été annoncé, euh, où les Israéliens ont trahi leurs alliés chrétiens du Sud, l'armée Lahad, euh, à la prise de ce territoire par le Hezbollah. Pas une gifle, pas un vol, pas un viol, la discipline. Et cette discipline dont a fait preuve le Hezbollah, il y a quelques officiers de l'armée Lahad qui ont été, mais ils n'ont ils ont pas été lynchés, ils ont été apportés à la justice. Et je pense que le Hamas, euh, il y aura des conséquences pour le Hamas dans euh, cette incroyable indiscipline des soldats qui ont, qui ont commis toutes ces horreurs. Alors ensuite, les, les conséquences modules. Et bien évidemment, nous avons, et ça a été dit par Dorothée, euh, une polarisation accrue entre euh, l'Occident et le Sud global, le Sud global, disons, de poids, de mesure. Parce que le ressenti, c'est que on a entendu les Occidentaux donner énormément de leçons, euh, notamment lors de la destruction de Mariupol à, à la Russie, à Vladimir Poutine. Et là, euh, l'ensemble, pas seulement les musulmans du monde entier, qui euh, se sont ralliés derrière le, euh, la bannière du, du Hamas, mais aussi en Amérique latine, en Afrique, les gens disent, mais euh, les bombes américaines à Gaza font exactement la même chose. C'est Mariupol qu'on voit qui se, qui se fait. Donc c'était un cadeau incroyable qui a été fait euh, à, à Poutine. Autre conséquence euh, économique, euh, le Premier ministre Netanyahu avait annoncé, vous vous souvenez, à la tribune des Nations Unies, la constitution d'un nouveau corridor économique euh, entre, euh, donc il avait dit, euh, l'Inde, euh, les Émirats, l'Arabie Saoudite, la Jordanie, Israël, l'Italie, qui devait concurrencer donc, euh, un autre projet de route de la soie, Chine, euh, Iran, Irak, Syrie, l'attaquer, la Grèce. Je pense qu'aujourd'hui, euh, le nouveau corridor annoncé euh, par euh, Netanyahou a vraiment, euh, comme les accords d'Abraham d'ailleurs, a vraiment euh, du, euh, du plomb dans l'aile. Euh, alors, pour conclure, on peut dire qu'il y a quand même une bonne nouvelle à tout ça, c'est qu'il y a un consensus mondial, peut-être pas à l'intérieur de la société israélienne, mais même, même dans la société israélienne, il y a beaucoup de gens qui sont d'accord, qu'il faut régler une fois pour toutes la, euh, le problème palestinien. Vous l'avez dit, c'est tout à fait faux de dire que c'est impossible à faire. C'est difficile, mais c'est tout à fait possible. Euh, même, les, les, il, faut, il suffit de regarder les accords, les négociations de tabac. Euh, bien sûr qu'on peut avoir Jérusalem-Est comme capitale d'un État palestinien, d'ailleurs, parce qu'il suffit de se promener à la porte de Damas, il n'y a que des Arabes qui habitent là, euh, et il y a des échanges de territoires qui sont possibles pour que euh, euh, l'État palestinien fasse les 22% de la Palestine mandataire qui euh, ont été acceptés à Alger par Arafat en 1988. Euh, mais comme l'a dit euh, Eli Barnavi, qui était ancien, un historien israélien, qui est l'ancien ambassadeur euh, d'Israël à Paris, en fait, euh, Israël, le, pour, le, pour son bien, doit se voir imposer une solution, parce qu'Israël est, est trop fort, et donc seule une conférence internationale peut imposer une solution euh, à Israël. Euh, cette conférence internationale n'est pas très difficile à organiser parce qu'en fait, c'est un sujet où vous avez une convergence. Les Américains, les Russes, les Chinois, les Français, les Anglais, euh, les, euh, le plan saoudien, les Arabes, ont à peu près la même idée, en fait. Le problème qu'on a, c'est que ces grands acteurs internationaux sont d'accord sur la solution pour le problème israélo-palestinien, mais ces tripes par ailleurs, sur d'autres sujets. Alors, est-ce que la réunion est possible C'est une question de Sir, technique... We're going to have to, okay. to leave it here. Je, je finis là. C'est une question de technique diplomatique. Yeah. Les gens de la 
Mmh. Euh, WTC Alors... sont les meilleurs et donc j'attends euh, euh, vos suggestions. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your, your observations there, which uh, gave, gave us a, a sense of the global implications of this conflict, that it's not just an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's not just a regional conflict. There are the stakeholders in this uh, go far beyond the region, and the uh, repercussions are indeed being felt all around the world. There's, there's no doubt about that. We feel it in, in Western Europe, where I live. Uh, it's being felt in North America. It's being felt in... Uh, in Latin America, as you pointed out, in, in many different parts of the world. So there's, there's a lot uh, that is dependent on what happens next. Thank you very much for now. And I have to apologize for, I've let, I think most of our speakers kind of go on a little longer than the allotted time. Uh, so my, my apologies uh, to, to the audience for, um, for not leaving as much time for our discussion at the end as I would like. Uh, but we are going to move towards, uh, towards that last phase of the program, and it's uh, my, my great pleasure to have Mohammed Baharun now uh, give his observations. Thank you very much. I'll try to get to the seven uh, uh, minutes mark, hopefully. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me, and uh, welcome uh, to all of uh, people who traveled a long way to be here in the UAE to be part of this discussion. Uh, the, the title of the discussion, and this is a, a sort of a warning I think we've heard, is the Middle East in the next five months. So That's right. One next Middle few East, months, yeah. Next few months. That was the title. Uh, Middle East uh, warning, nothing about this region is regional. Everything is global, and I think we've just heard that. Uh, so there's always global implications of everything. And uh, uh, five months we've already, or sorry, a few months, we've already heard that a month ago things could have changed. And I think this could stay. Uh, but let me talk about Gaza as an example. And this is... Uh, when it comes to the operation, it's a local operation. We've got Israeli troops, and the, uh, they are op conducting an operation in, in Gaza, which is uh, an occupied land, even though it's autonomous. So it's a local war, supposedly. But there's also a lot of regional fears, and we've heard uh, the fear about Iran or its proxy being involved, and this war could spill out, and that's one of those fears. But there are also international realities. And part of the international realities is that there's about 40,000 American troops assembled in, in, in the region. And we've got uh, uh, warships from the US, from the UK, from France, from Greece in, 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 in the region. And uh, we've also heard calls to turn the international coalition against ISIS to fight Hamas. So there is a reality here that this is already internationalized. We're afraid of regionalizing it, but in reality, it is internationalized, and that is going to affect us. Now, if we want to talk about the, what could happen in the few next months, and I think the current progress of the operation, and we've seen to the extent how many times uh, the ground operation has been either delayed or changed over the week, can tell us that this is going to be a lengthy operation. And with that length of time will come casualties in, in people. And that casualty of people, people would have an impact, not only regionally, but also internationally. Also, the objectives of the military, which is eliminating Hamas, is you know, very difficult to say, at this point of time, we can call this mission a success, mission accomplished. It is very difficult to draw lines on when that mission has been accomplished. Again, that would draw a lot of time and would also uh, 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 affect uh, uh, the casualties. Uh, but also, there is this concept of those bridges of cooperation that we have been building is now regressing. So we've already seen the impact on countries like Turkey, already mentioned. Countries like Egypt has been warning that if people have been driven into Gaza, an operation across the borders can, to Israel, a response from the Israeli, could take us back to the time when there is war. You know, we're going back to the 1973. So uh, those bridges of cooperation are now being hugely challenged. And what it tells us that this, the clock in this region is ticking backwards. We're looking backwards when the terrorist organization that was considered a terrorist organization today, it's very difficult to discriminate it from the Palestinian people. And you can see people going out in the streets calling for free Palestine, 
no one sits down to Hamas. So that area that between what is right and what is wrong, and it's not because of the virtue of what Hamas did, it's because of the virtue of the reaction to Hamas. And I think the, the concept of, of, of international law when it comes to wars come to mind, but it's the sheer understanding is that what do you do for peace? And I think this is the role of the armed struggle, I think, is coming back. And Hamas is possibly now in the same position where PLO used to be during the Munich uh, attack. And, you know, this is now people are saying again that this is uh, ISIS is different from Hamas because ISIS has occupied land, but Hamas did not occupy land, it is occupied. Those type of com you know, comparisons are now becoming common ground, which hasn't been two months ago or three months ago. And what we've heard several times here, and I think uh, His Excellency Fahmi was talking about the national identity. Uh, this is going back to become an identity conflict. And unfortunately, it's not a nation-based. It's a, a religious identity. It's a Jewish identity. And it's, it's quite you know, difficult when you see, uh, for instance, Secretary Blinken coming to Israel after the attack and say, I'm Jewish. I know what he's doing, but for the rest of the world, what they see is that this is now turning into a Jewish-Muslims conflict. And that is a very difficult position to be in because it will bring back all of those identity conflicts that we have seen in the, in the past. So if you want to look not only to the next few months because it's you know, really very limited, what are the long-term impact in the next few years? So I think one of what we've heard is the detraction of the, of the West, of the global West, in front of the expansion of the global uh, South. It's not the North versus the South, it's the South versus the West. And we've heard this very clearly before, and I think this is a reality. If you look at the uh, 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 pattern of, of voting in the UN, this is quite obvious. And I, I think we shouldn't be slipping into that type when whatever is always connected to international community, to international norm, can be just looked at as this is just the Western norms. And it does not apply all the time. It applies in certain times. I mean, people would say, uh, you want Iran not to intervene, but the US is already intervening on the ground. And that's contradictory in, 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 in when it comes to principles. And uh, we're also looking at the rise of the middle powers. Middle power states are now taking lead because the international leadership is not being regarded as something that is going to take us somewhere. And it's quite interesting uh, to see, for instance, countries like Saudi Arabia or the UAE celebrating the G77 over the G7 because they see that the future of the world order is to the middle and small powers organizing together, galvanizing a position together. But there is still opportunities, and I think one of those opportunities is... is uh, is the analogy Volker made uh, on the, what happened after 1973, which is the peace. Because any war, any war conducted is, is a tool. It is not an objective. And the objective of any war is peace. So how could we, peace be looked at in, in this? So uh, I think one of the major concepts that we can see today is that there is a failure of the concept of security at gunpoint. Weapons do not buy security. Security concept is changing. We have seen this here in the UAE after COVID-19. We've seen that with all of the military mind that you might have, it's not going to stop your people from dying. And we realize that walls is not going to buy security. It is roads that will create security. I don't think that this is a concept that is being seen inside Israel today as we see it here in this region. Uh, I think Hamas is in a position to do exactly what the PLO did at a certain point of time, exactly what the Houthis did recently, is turn from a resistance group into a state. And I think this is where we need an investment in statehood. The statehood not only of the Palestinian state, but also the statehood of Israel. Because Israel is our partner in peace. Hamas was not our partner in peace. But at this point of time, it is difficult to have partner in peace who does not do their uh, uh, due share when it comes to uh, peace. 
And, uh, and I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I might say something later on about what Iran uh, could be looking at, but I'll stop there. I really appreciate uh, you pointing out the fault lines uh, that are associated with this conflict uh, that extend uh, to different regions, not only this region, but to other parts of the world. It was interesting to me how you uh, set up a, an opposition between uh, the West and the South, uh, in this case, when we talk about what is the rest, when we talk about the, the West versus the rest. Uh, we've had that located in China and Russia. We've had it located now in the South, I presume the global South you're referring to there, by, by, and by that probably emerging nations. Um, I also found it interesting, your reference to Iran, uh, and it's the contrast with the United States. Uh, I mean, Iran, of course, has its proxies in the region, uh, so they're not official forces, but I found that interesting uh, parallel. But um, I, you know, we, we are going to be coming back to this. We only have like 13 minutes uh, left in this session, and I'm told that I need to be uh, on time. I'm only going to ask one question. I've been preparing this for some time, as you <laughs> might imagine. Uh, so I have lots of questions here, but I'm only going to put one question to the panel. Uh, and we don't need answers from everyone, but maybe someone who wishes to, to jump in on this uh, before I open the floor. And that is uh, the question, so what next? Uh, the, we've talked about the, this possibly indeed creating conditions that would allow the pursuit of a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which would have great, great value. Folke Pat has suggested uh, steps that could be done in that process, but the question is, under the auspices of whom? Uh, who, how would that process be started? How would it be organized? Who would take the lead on that? Uh, would it be the United Nations, the United States, the EU? The EU has offered to host a peace conference. We've seen Egypt host a, a peace conference very, very early on that didn't get too far. But where, you know, how do we begin to work on a solution under what construct? Any ideas from any of you? What would be most promising? May I say that uh, any solution should start in Israel and then Palestine? which means we now need a goodwill capital from Israel saying, I am in for a two-state solution. Because unless that is clear, any effort we're doing is going to be momentary. The willingness, of course, would need to be there on, on both sides. That's clear. But I'm just wondering, under whose auspices? Okay, that has one of the things, the auspices is, a, is an easy one. You can have it under the auspices of the United Nations. But... The question is, who leads the conference? And I think if you don't have the heavyweights in, it will not lead to anything. I mean, remember 1991. If, if at that time the US hadn't been there, together with the Soviet Union, which was on its last breath, it wouldn't have gone forward. So it's very clear that the US has to be at the head table and leading it and putting all its weight behind. And then you have to ask, who are the main associates which the United States needs in the current geopolitical and regional situation. And here would say China has to be at the head table. There is no, I mean, you can have, add others, but China has to be there. And yet then you have to have the Arab states who already have peace with Israel at the head table. Um, we don't have to make peace between Israel and the Emirates or between Israel and Jordan or Israel and Egypt or Israel and Morocco. But these states have to be there as key mediators. When you say the main players in, that would that need to be at the head of the table in dealing with this, what about the elephant in the room? What about Iran? Well, the elephant has to be at the table, but not at the head table. <laughs> okay. So, so Iran does need to be part of this, and that, that would imply direct talks with Iran, which uh, would be an interesting prospect in itself. Um, I saw there was, you wanted to intervene quickly or, or not? Just quickly, yeah, and then yeah. I'm going to open the floor. Yes, very quickly. It's impossible to take a step to deal with Gaza if you don't also link it to where you're going after Gaza. Arabs will not create a force or be responsible for Gaza after all the devastation that occurred on the ground unless they can argue this is a step towards the two-state solution. So there has to be not only a statement, also a linkage to where we're going towards the end of this. And let me just make, again, one, my last point. You should not be surprised 
why the Arabs are looking at the West as being biased. You are biased. But the, the, what, what surprised people in the Arab world isn't your bias. It is how far that bias is when you stand up against a ceasefire, against uh, even humanitarian ceasefires. When you attend a war cabinet, then you can only blame yourself for the perception you leave. Okay, uh, that was a, a reference to Joe Biden's uh, visit to, to Israel. Okay, we are going to open up the floor now. Uh, we, I see many questions on, on both sides. Um, we'll start from, we'll go one in the middle, then to the right, and then to the left. So, sir. Uh, I'm Stan, Stan Cosmo from Capgemini. One observation and a question. Observation is that, to my knowledge, the last time there was a serious attempt at a two-state solution was 23 years ago, Bill Clinton, Ehud Barak, and Yasser Arafat. Trying to translate that today, clearly it can't be Netanyahu and Hamas. So it has to be a change in governance on both sides to make this happen with the support of, of this conference that you have been talking about. Now my question is, assuming fast forwarding to, let's say, March next year, assuming that this conference takes place with intent to have a two-state solution blessed by this community we mentioned before, what would that look like? It can't be Gaza plus Jordania, it doesn't make sense. So what could be the border between two states under this scheme? Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just comment before we pick up one more. There was, I was going to the lady here, and then to the gentleman in the third row, and then, sir, we'll come to you, but not, not quite yet. We'll come to you in a moment. Uh, so, the lady, I just want to point out that in the year 2000, during uh, Camp David, when Ehud Barak and Yasser Arafat uh, met at, uh, in, in the United States, I was working for CNN at the time, and it was one of the most uh, poignant moments of my life when we got um, Saeb Arakat on the phone walking out of the White House and I put the question to him, why are you walking away from this deal which seemed so close to a, to a two-state solution? And he told me uh, the right of return of refugees. This is, I mean, there are multiple issues but this is something that also I'm sure would have to be addressed along with the future of Jerusalem and, and the West Bank. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I uh, enjoyed the remarks that uh, Itamar Rabinovich said, which is, let's talk now about the day after. I have followed lately the, the, the comments of a, what he calls himself, a f f uh, next leader of the Palestinian uh, Authority, once Mr. Abbas passes away which is, I don't think would be very far. So he believes that there is no such thing as a two-state solution, that Netanyahu has killed it. So now we have to talk about the one-state solution. That's what he says. And he thinks that the beginning of this is to get Mr. Netanyahu out. I think that Mr. Rabinovich says exactly the same thing because they can have a new government. With a new government, it will probably be the people who are now demonstrating against Netanyahu who will form this new government and who will be much more amenable to uh, speak about the solution of the Palestinian question. Okay. Uh, if you, please ask your question because we only have five minutes left. Huh? Please ask your question. If My you have question? a question. Yes. No, if you have a question or if you have one, one quick comment in there, because we do want to allow no, others. I have yeah. a comment, not okay. a question. Please. What I just okay. said. Quickly. That this Palestinian would, leader please. lives here. He's called Mohammed Dahlan. He has excellent uh, uh, connections with Israel, with Egypt, with, uh, with the ruler here. And I think that he should be put at the table and discuss what could happen because he has supporters inside Gaza. Thank you very much. Yeah, there, he's been giving uh, some interesting interviews that uh, are providing some insights. So now to the gentleman uh, who has his hand up, if we could get the microphone there, and then we're going to get some responses from the panel. Thank you very much. Uh, Hiro Akita Nikkei from Tokyo. Uh, just two quick questions about the uh, long-term uh, geopolitical landscape. Question one, uh, what is the prospect of Abraham Accord paradigm? It, make, it seems to make sense to achieve uh, you know, uh, 
Abraham Agur paradigm um, seems to make sense before October 7, but uh, now uh, Abraham Agur paradigm will get suspended unless two-state solution will get realized or it can go parallel. And second question is, uh, if Abraham Accord will be suspended, Accord, uh, Abraham Accord trend will be suspended for maybe how in, in the meantime, how will Gulf state coexist with Iran? Thank you. Thank you very much. All, all relevant points and questions. We're going to just take these three first, get a response, and if we still have time, sir, we'll, we'll, be, we'll get to you. Um, so anyone on the panel like to take any of those points that were made? We've got a couple of things on the table. Um, is is Noah Abinovich here? Very, very well. Please join us. Yeah. The floor is yeah. yours. Okay. So uh, the key is to bring the Palestinian Authority back into the picture. First, if there is an interim arrangement in Gaza, be it Arab, be it international, it has to be temporary. And the Palestinian Authority that was expelled from Gaza violently by Hamas should return to Gaza and administer it. This should invigorate the Palestinian Authority and make it again a viable partner for Israel to discuss a long-range two-state solution. Put it on the agenda Again, this would enable other Arab states or the Arab states uh, to join it. We don't have too much time. Remember, it's an election year in the United States, and uh, we don't have too many uh, too, ne too many months to uh, to wait until that that happens. So action should begin quite immediately. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. There was a question about what kind of two-state solution. If, you, if I take you back not only to the Camp David negotiations between Israelis and, uh, and the Palestinians and ultimately the Clinton parameters, but I even take you back to what you said earlier, the Taba talks, all of the details of every single item are dealt with there. There was no formal approval of these items for different political reasons. So my point really is, it's not about that somebody have to come up with a new formula for the border. It's 67, possibly with some minor exchanges <coughs> or refugees. That's in the, uh, the, the Arab Peace Initiative, which talks about the return, uh, an agreement on return of refugees, uh, and so on and so forth, in including East Jerusalem. It's about the lack of political will. So what I was trying to say at the beginning is, let's put the essence in as much detail as we can of what the package would look like to resolve this once and for all. If it results in a change of leadership on one side or on both sides, ultimately that's not my concern. My concern is the change moving towards peace between Arabs and Israelis, particularly Palestinians, rather than moving towards uh, a, a new cycle of violence. There is no permanent security if the conflict continues. Great, thank you. Uh, then we will take one more question from the gentleman here in the second row, and that will be our last question for today. Then we're out of time. Bon, il me semble que tout le monde est d'accord pour une démarche diplomatique qui aboutirait à mettre les parties sur une même table et négocier. Mais n'oublions pas qu'il y a eu déjà plusieurs conférences, plusieurs réunions, pour ne citer que Camp David, Madrid, Oslo, qui n'ont pas abouti à la solution de paix tel que réclamé par les Palestiniens pour avoir leurs droits, c'est-à-dire un État palestinien avec Jérusalem-Est comme euh, capitale. Et cela, ces processus a échoué à cause de, euh, de la gouvernance du gouvernement israélien qui n'a pas suivi. Maintenant, ma question à M. Brahimovic, Est-ce que 
les, euh, la crise de Gaza va faire prendre une prise de conscience en Israël pour aboutir à un pouvoir politique qui accepterait le droit palestinien à un État. Merci. Very good, yeah, Mr. Eber. I can answer that. Go ahead. Yeah, I can answer that. Uh, public opinion polls in Israel show that 80% of the Israeli public lost their faith in the government. And uh, there is a debate whether you go through a change of government in the middle of a war or do you want, you want to wait to the end of the, of the fighting. This could happen either through a new election or through other mechanisms that the Israeli constitution, constitutional arrangements. So I'm sure that sooner or later there will be a different government in, in Israel. Hopefully find good partners on the other side. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, I'm afraid we are out of time. I, when I've been told not to go over, and I also know that some people have to catch a plane. <laughs> so uh, we're going to leave it here. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks to our panel. A warm round of applause for a great discussion.